little bit about the Commissioner's Student Advisory Council. Um, we have about 29 members. Um, they are represented from all over the states. You'll see here today we have everyone from Marshall County, Lyon County, um, Eastern Kentucky, uh, Kentucky School for the Deaf, Kentucky School for the Blind. Um, it, is, it is set up that way so that uh, we do have students at the cross section of the entire state. Um, and so they meet, uh, we meet every month, uh, three times a year in person. This is our second in person meeting of the year. Um, and this project that they're going to share with you um, started, um, started actually on May 3rd, following the May 31st meeting of last year. So there's a little bit of overlap. Um, we had a couple of students that were kind of part of the initial that they've graduated. Um, and then we have new students that started in August that have also been working on the project. Um, so without further ado, I will kick off to, I'm not sure who's starting. Yes. Thank you. Um, well, I'd like to introduce uh, Representative Tipton as well. Uh, Representative Tipton uh, is the uh, new chair of the House Education Committee. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, education couldn't have uh, a strong voice. So we'll take it. We are so grateful for your leadership in that role. We'll also so grateful that you're here uh, with us today. Um, uh, Representative Tipton is an incredibly effective um, and strong legislator. So we're we're really fortunate to have him in that role. This work around uh, school safety and the brief that the students put together really came about um, after the Uvalde shooting. We had a student. Uh, advisory council meeting just in the, a couple of days after that uh, uh, terrible uh, tragedy in Texas. Uh, and the students that they had a lot on their minds, a lot of um, feelings and thoughts and perspective on what happened in Uvalde. Of course, it was at that point very raw. Uh, it just happened and we we're still processing through all of the facts and trying to ascertain what happened and didn't happen that led to that that uh, terrible event. Um, and the students uh, felt like that in the course of discussion around school safety, uh, there are a lot of experts, uh, there are a lot of uh, political uh, influencers and uh, movers that weigh in on that, but the voice of the students is not something that's often taken into perspective. Um, so uh, the student group wanted to pull together what are their perspectives and thoughts on school safety and weigh in on that. Um, so we are here today to uh, release the student's work. It is entirely put together by the help and support them from the Kentucky Department of Education, but the students are the ones that uh, formed the groups. They did the writing, they did the thinking, and they put these perspectives together and used a consensus model. So they all uh, are standing in agreement behind these as the recommendations that they have. Um, of course, this couldn't come at a, um, at a uh, more opportune or maybe more challenging time uh, when we look at where we are in the nation in terms of students right now. Uh, there have been, um, at, uh, according to the New York Times this morning, 39 school shootings, 39 mass murders, not school shootings, 39 mass murders that have killed four or more people since January 1st in the United States. There um, have been a total of 69 persons killed just in this month, in this beginning of 2023. And uh, of course, just in the last few days, we've seen two mass murders in California, uh, one in the Los Angeles area at the Monterey Park, and one in the Bay Area with uh, Half Moon uh, Bay. Uh, and then just yesterday, a uh, school shooting at a uh, charter school in Des Moines, Iowa uh, took place. So uh, this is certainly timely and relevant. All of us are interested in how we can uh, keep our schools and our communities safer. The perspective of students is something that uh, we really value and, and want more in this conversation. So with that, I'll turn things over to the students. Who is our lead presenter? Okay, Peter, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the Commissioner Glass and the Kentucky Department of Education for allowing us all to be here on this wonderful council. I also like to thank Representative Tipton. We've all heard wonderful things about your work in the legislature as a champion of education. Today we have a presentation for you. It is our recommendations on school safety in a brief entitled A Focus on School Safety. Okay, so um, first of all, I would like to just introduce um, everyone in the room. 
So if we could just go around and say our names and where we're from, that would be great. My name is Delaney Darty. I'm from Miller High School and I'm a senior. Hi, I'm Shami Nabar. I'm, I'm a junior at Tupac Manual High School from Jefferson County. Oh, I'm Peter Jefferson. I am a sophomore at Henry Clay High School in Bay County. Good morning. My name is Justin Denning, and I am a junior at Lyon County High School. Hi, I'm Alexandra Perry. I am a senior at the Ignite Institute in Duke County. Hi, my name is Debbie White. I'm a junior at the School of Hi, I'm Gavin Brunick. I'm a senior at Elizabethtown High School. Hi, my name is Jude Dale, and I'm a junior at the Ignite Institute in Boone County. Good morning, my name is Sarah Umbarger, and I'm a junior at Marshall County High School. Hi, I'm Anastasia Pinaritas, and I'm a senior at South Oakland High School. Hi, my name is Chloe Rowling, and I'm a senior at Lincoln County. Hi, my name is Chloe Ralston, and I'm a senior from Lincoln County. And I'm Mallory Taylor, I'm a junior at the Crack Academy in Brown County. Hi, I'm Robert Dutt, I'm a junior at DuPont Manual in Jefferson County. Hi, I'm Spongebob Pavlori. I'm a senior at DuPont Manual at Jefferson County. So to start off, um, I'd like to talk about where we began this project. So um, all of us on this council, obviously, we deeply care about education, getting a quality education, and that can't happen without having a safe school environment. So following the Uvalde shooting, as Commissioner Glass said, we all had a lot of big emotions and we needed somewhere to put that. We needed, we realized we needed to use our voices to change. Um, so to do that, we divided, we started by dividing into subgroups. Um, we decided that was the most efficient way to organize our information so that each group could be most specialized in their area. So to do, uh, the groups that we split into were before the incident, during the incident, and after the incident. So um, each group was specialized in their own individual area and was able to do research, but eventually we all came together and agreed that each section did it, went together and did flash. So um, for the most part, we, we, we did pretty much everything ourselves, but we did have some help from our adults. Um, we had guided questions that helped us with revising what we had already written, such as like, is the author cited? Can I defend the statement? Have we identified the strongest recommendations we can? Um, and where can we expand our thinking? So that's kind of how we began the project and what we started. On the next slide, we talk about our method, how we created these recommendations. We began by dividing into subgroups, as Mally said, and within these subgroups, we brainstormed. Each student was allowed to state their own opinions and their experiences regarding school safety. Many of us gave anecdotes and, and experiences from our school about issues of school safety and possible solutions that may have been implemented in our school. Over the summer, before we over the summer, as we were in our subgroups, we also did independent research. This research was part of the foundation of our recommendations. And as we started to form our recommendations from brainstorming, we began to do more research. We researched for scholarly articles and solid statistics that would allow us to base our recommendations in science and fact. This way, we can take our student experiences, our student recommendations, and combine them with real science and research to create the best recommendations for the legislature. Our first group discussed actions that can be taken prior to an incident. We focused on what we can do to minimize the chance of an event and found some important recommendations from various studies and statistics. The first one we discussed is promoting the stop tip button. Stop tip button is an anonymous reporting tool that is required to be available at all community schools. However, the Safe School Initiative found that 66% of attackers were engaged in concerning behaviors prior to the attack that went unreported. While students are the best resources for identifying concerning behaviors in their peers, there is a lack of awareness and encouragement for student reporting. To promote awareness, we suggest using strategies commonly used in mental health awareness. One, reassure students that overreacting will not be punished. Two, send out written information to every student detailing the tip line at the beginning of each year. And three, provide a short training to each student on recognizing and reporting concerning behaviors at the beginning of each year. 
Another method we decided on where it was <clears throat> improving the intervention rates. According to a 2019 report from the Secret Service, 80% of the attackers studied had experienced some form of bullying consistency. Of the bullied attackers, 34% had school officials that were aware of the bullying. In a few cases, uh, there were no evidence uh, that the school addressed the situation. Additionally, 71% uh, of the attackers received disciplinary actions for a concerning behavior prior to their attack. But only 23% of those were di uh, disciplined uh, and were referred to a team of mental health professionals for an evaluation, assessment, or support services. Also, we need to support gun control. Federally licensed gun dealers must require background checks for anyone purchasing a firearm. As mental health awareness and information is increasing each day, we know more about it than ever. Tragic events can result from giving firearms to those that are mentally unfit. Statistics show that uh, 28 out of 37 mass sh uh, shooters between 1982 and 2019 were diagnosed with some type of mental illness. Firearm safety could be greatly improved and these events prevented if you were requiring mental health screenings before the purchase of specific firearms. Next, we'll be discussing the during the incident section, where our primary focus is what is our best response plan in the event of a school shoot. The first recommendation we have is improving uh, active shooter drills. Current school drills typically are lock your doors, cover your windows, lock your windows if you have them to the outside, and put desks and other heavy objects behind the door and hide in a corner where you cannot be seen. Though these are preventative measures, what if the school shooter is right next to you? What are you to do? Our recommendation is to make these drills more realistic and like a simulation, where we have SROs, first responders, teachers, and maybe even actors a part of the simulation so we get a real idea of this is how we get out of this building safely. The simulation will vary on intensity based on school levels because we care about our students' mental health and we do not want to create traumatic events for our younger students. This simulation will be put out to the districts two weeks in advance where we will have a meeting with all students and parents of that district telling them what to expect from the simulation and what the simulation is to accomplish. In the event that a parent does not feel like their student is mentally stable enough or feels like this caused trauma to their student, they have the ability within those two weeks to let the school know that their student will not be participating in this simulation. The night before the simulation is to occur, the Parents will be getting a notification that they should keep their students home that day. During the day of the drill, SROs, administration, and all school enforcement will be um, enforcing the rules as strictly as possible to allow the students fully understand what is happening. In order for these simulations and drills to be successful, the staff, SROs, and first responders need the most factual and hands-on training available. This brings us to our next recommendation, which is improving training for all students and first responders that will be on the scene of an active shooter. After the past few school shootings, and especially after the Texas elementary school shootings, it became apparent that there is a lack of training for any SRO and first responder. As a group, we discussed having regional training centers across the state that are having that will be giving high intensity situations for active shooting drills and showing them what to do. After talking with Dr. Glass and Dr. Woodstucker, as they were the adults that we would talk to most of the time, we found that since they both worked in the Colorado school districts, that they had dedicated training centers in Whitbridge, uh, Colorado, that modeled the most effective approach to teaching and training all bodies involved. The most important thing is that SROs, staff, and first responders feel confident that they know what to do so they can ease the minds of parents and students going into these simulations in, in the event of an actual shooting. So during our work, we figured out that a key tool in an active shooter situation is communication. Even in the building, we need words such as, this is not a drill, or this is real, to let students know the urgency of a situation. We also figured out that, you know, we can tell the students all day long, this is not a drill, but parents are also in the dark when most of these things happen. So we started looking at notification systems for schools to be able to send out messages, not only to parents, but to students and teachers as well, detailing what's going on and what next steps you should take to, to stay safe. So 
we have a statewide system called Infinite Campus, which is already in place. And after speaking with students and administrators, we figured out that Infinite Campus can push notifications through text, email, and phone calls at the push of a button. And there, the parents' and students' numbers are automatically put into the system at the beginning of the school year with registration. So we would need a staff member at each school to be in charge of the notification system. So when an event happens, they can quickly and, how do I say, you know, intently notify parents, students, and staff of what is going on and what their next steps should be. We even spoke about a um, stipend for those for those staff members, you know, because they have these extra duties within the school system. Well, the preventative measures are obviously the most effective at reducing the frequency of school shootings. Taking steps to ensure that students feel safe when they ultimately come back into school is critical. After an incident, the number one priority is the mental health of students, staff, and faculty. According to the American Psychological Organization, 28% of people who have witnessed a mass shooting develop post-traumatic stress disorder. This can cause negative consequences on the learning environment. A school-based crisis intervention team needs to be in place to provide support and assistance to children in the aftermath of a crisis, including triage, short-term counseling, and referral to community services. These professionals should be kept for the remainder of the school year through summer and be available to students at all times without cost to their family. Additionally, the creation of support groups in the community may be needed. Students may feel more isolated due to experiencing a traumatic event, and support groups may allow them to process and rely on others for help. Throughout their entire life, the trauma experienced after school shootings remains with students. As such, policies should consider the residual effects of school shootings on student grades, achievements, and attendance. By adapting the emotions of students, Schools can ensure the success of student achievement while not forcing students to be stressed about both grades and the school shooting. After an incident, promoting a sense of community is vital for the well-being of students. To let families express their emotions, local specialists can encourage student-led vigils, support groups, group therapy sessions, and school board meetings. Due to their knowledge of the community, local specialists are best recommended. However, if funds are available, available, local counselors, mental health professionals, and leaders of faith-based organizations should be trained on trauma counseling. With this, donations are important in funding funerals, vigils, and other relief services. As witnessed, educational town hall style meetings um, allow caregivers to attempt to understand their children's behavior and attempt to produce a plan for when these students re-enter school. It is important that volunteer clinicians are thoroughly trained in trauma and grief-informed practices, as well as on preventing sec secondary traumatic stress. Even if families don't take it, it is important to show that support is available. With these town hall meetings, community members will be provided with resources to begin the healing process. The final post-incident section we'd like to hit on is repairing and rebuilding the school. Given such circumstances, the school's physical environment can be very triggering for students and staff. You suggest that the school undergoes visual changes and also adopts more security features. To do so, the state must allocate emergency funds, which aids the community impacted. Outside funding pages led by local organizations can also help pay for counseling, food, shelter, improvement of school security and infrastructure, and other vital post-incident services. Along with the emergency fund, we want to highlight the importance of support. State leaders and those who represent Kentucky should be active and involved in helping the community involved. By continuously engaging with the community, members understand that the issue is being taken seriously and they are not alone. Lastly, under the section, we would like to note that the active shooter drills must be redesigned. These drills can be extremely triggering for students and staff, but we know, we know they are vital. We suggest that each teacher be informed when the drill will be taking place two weeks in advance. We also want to make sure that students are aware of the drill. This allows students to prepare themselves mentally, but also allows them time to reach out for help if they feel they need it or to opt out of the drill. Um, so in conclusion, we have uh, found that school safety is a serious issue that um, is pretty present in the minds of students from across the country. Uh, we, these students who think about this would like 
uh, one tangible change made at an administrative and legislative level to increase their safety. Uh, these changes can include but are not limited to um, increasing the amount of training and improving that training for first responders, including SROs, students, faculty, staff at schools, and providing mental health supports for the community during and after the incident first. Thank you so much for listening to our presentation, and we are now open to any questions. Let's start with representative and any uh, feedback or questions. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, and I want to thank each and every one of you for your work on this. It's obvious that they took this project very seriously, and I understand why, because it impacts you, it impacts your friends and fellow students at school, and it's also it's just apparent that the amount of time and research and thoughtful approach that you do did in preparing it. So I want to assure you that I will read this in its entirety. I'll digest it. Uh, hopefully, this is available in an electronic format. We can share it with the other members of General Assembly so they can have that as well. Uh, back, yeah, little, back in 2018, as a member of the House Education Committee, we were in session. Uh, we were having a meeting one morning, and, and, and Sarah, I know you're going to remember this because at the end of that meeting, uh, Representative Van Carney, who was chairman, made the announcement to us that there had been a school shooting in Marshall County High School. And, and, and I just, uh, you know, remember just such an empty, sick feeling in my stomach that day that, you know, it happened here in Kentucky. Uh, after that incident happened, Chairman Carney and also uh, Senator Max Wise, who was chair of the Senate Education Committee at that time, assembled a group of stakeholders. They held regional meetings around the state. And as a result of that, in 2019, we passed Senate Bill 1, the School Safety Facility Act. And because of that, I firmly believe a lot of situations that happen evolving, we've already made some great strides there. But that does not mean we need to be complacent. We need to continue to look at this. We need to continue to study. We need to continue to learn when these unfortunate situations happen. And, you know, I truly believe that a lot of times we see the school shoot as a symptom of a much larger problem that's going on in someone's life. And you all refer to that. I really believe we have to address what are these root problems? What are the root causes that would cause someone to want to take such, a, such an act? And uh, I appreciate your efforts. I appreciate your time. And uh, don't be surprised if you get an invitation to come to the General Assembly in the near future. Thank you, Representative Tipton. Uh, I wonder if uh, you could, uh, the students were aware of Senate Bill 1 and the impact that it's had. I wonder if you could talk about that legislation and share it all. I think one of the main components of that is we do have a state school marshal. And all schools in the state are inspected. They have a they, they are reviewed every year. And uh, I recently have been visiting some schools in the state. And when I talk to administrators, I always ask them about their inspection and visit from the school marshal. And you know, I think we have seen a testimony last year, uh, we had an almost 100% compliance with the act with Senate Bill 1 as they went around to schools. And, and the school marshals are not there to be punitive. if they're there to be offer constructive criticism and help to help these schools identify areas they need to improve on. And, and there are areas that we need to improve on. Uh, I do uh, did have visited schools in the state. I have a school in my district that uh, when you uh, are allowed into the high school, you have open access. There's not that foyer there. And I think that's one area we need to improve on. We need to, uh, there are things like a bullet resistant glass film that can be put on glass. Uh, those things require funding. And, and, and one of the downfalls of Senate Bill 1 is we have provided some funding, but there is additional funding that is required specifically uh, for mental health counseling and school resource officers. And we've looked into that. Uh, we did pass legislation in the 2022 session uh, that strengthened the, the SRO provisions. I believe uh, it will help move us in that direction, but it's going to require some additional funding. Now, I will point out that 2023, this is our short session. Uh, we typically do not take up the budget in the short session, although sometimes things pop up. 
I'm hoping I've got a deal with a little appropriation commissioner blast I've been working on. But uh, as far as major items, I think we're going to have to focus for 2024. And I'm very hopeful as we go into the budget section, uh, we'll take your suggestions, your ideas, work with your school districts across the state, work with the Department of Education. It, it helps strengthen us. We'll think you've got some good ideas here about training, uh, about awareness, and also about uh, how, how to help the school community when it's, and be prepared in case we, we hope it never happens here in Kentucky. But it very well may, so we need to be prepared. And from your suggestion, I think we've got some great suggestions here we can work on. But uh, Senate Bill 1 is a great start, but we need to continue to work to improve it as we move forward. Uh, Bruce, if you're, I wonder if you have any questions for the students or if you have any uh, things that you'd like to ask for the students. I just want to say thank you, Representative Tipton. We worked super hard on this, and we're so glad that we were able to present to you in a manner where we can truly work forward together with the legislature and the Student Advisory Council. Thank you. You're very well, Peter. I think that concludes the presentation part. I again just wanted to reiterate that what you heard today um, is the work of all of our students. Uh, we did assist a little bit with the with the Department of Education, but really it was more administratively, uh, you know, and making sure that helping them make sure the report looks good. Um, but everything that they did and everything that you saw today was a presentation from our students. Um, and I think that's really important to really try to incorporate student voice in a lot of what we do here today. So. Thank you to all of our students. We're extremely proud of you. Um, and I can um, provide media. I'm assuming you may want to have um, a sidebar interview. We can break here um, for a few minutes. And I think we may just um, postpone the rest of the agenda um, and end after this. I just wanted to note that um, earlier today we did send out, we have opened our application period. This is really for our students to share and also our media partners to share that we have just opened up our application process for the 2023-24 uh, Commissioner's Student Advisory Council that uh, media advisory went out earlier today. Uh, we have about 17 seniors. I'm really sad to see so many of you all leave, uh, but you know that you're always welcome to come back and we, we keep in touch with a lot of our alumni. Um, it will be open until about the first week of March. Uh, we would like students from all over the state. Um, over the past two years, they have tackled issues like uh, student mental health uh, and now school safety. Uh, we are working on what uh, they may tackle next, um, but it's really it's just really a great group of kids and a great opportunity uh, for students across the state to have a seat at the table. Um, one of our, our current uh, student member on the Kentucky Board of Education is Jude. Um, she participates in the advisory as part of her role. Um, and just wanted to get that out there to make sure everybody knew about that. If you know of a, a sophomore, incoming sophomore, junior, or senior, uh, please encourage them to apply. Uh, we'd love to see them here in Frankfurt. Uh, and be part of projects that we're part of. We also have several students, uh, Representative Tipton, that are on virtually that couldn't be here today. Um, so really appreciate your uh, your um, visit here today and for listening to our students. Um, with that, we can wrap up uh, and head to lunch. Um, media, if you'd like to just touch base with me, if you'd like some additional interviews, I'm not sure if Representative Tipton has some time, they may want to talk to you, I'm guessing. <laughs> Uh, Ray is a former reporter here. I'm just guessing. So uh, with that, we will conclude today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you.